Hi, my name is Erica Poplinski, and I am here to present to you Head to Head, CI Activities and Why They Work, Maximizing the Brain's Potential. Well then, Socrates begins, the study of calculation and geometry and all the preparatory education required for dialectic must be put before them as children, and the instructor must not be given the aspect of a compulsion to learn. Why not? Because the free man ought not to learn any study slavishly. Forced labors performed by the body don't make the body any worse, but no forced study abides in the soul. True. Therefore, you best of men, don't you use force in training the children the subjects, but rather play. And that way can you better discern toward what each is naturally directed. And I am here today to tell you about how modern neuroscience agrees with these um, ancient teachers and why you as teachers can use this and how you can use this in your day-to-day -day, um, classroom for teachers to get the most out of class with your students. So what are we going to do today? We're going to learn exactly what happens in our brain when we learn. You guys are going to experience some examples of it working and I'm going to talk to you about how to use this information in your teaching. And just so you know that I'm not making it up, this information comes from my science undergrad. I have a master's in education. I have a plus 30 where I studied Spanish and neuroscience, and then I'm obsessed with the brain. And as we talk, you'll see why that helps me know how to share it with others. So who am I? I have a major in elementary education, minors in Spanish and science, a master's in the art of teaching, kind of talked about all of this. Um, this is my 15th year in the classroom. And I am an elementary Spanish teacher for Ann Arbor Public Schools, and I worked on many different CI elementary curriculums, and I'm a mom to three. And that's important, and there's two of them, and there's a third, because as I study the theory of language acquisition and how things work, I can actually also see how it um, develops in my own children, and that helps me apply my theories. So we're going to start with an analogy, which I always think is helpful. Polar bears are a very well adapted predator for their environment. Their white fur provides camouflage while black skin soaks in and holds the sun rays. Their small ears reduce heat loss. Their strong legs help them swim and run incredible distances. And they have a thick layer of fat for insulation and stored energy. They also have large feet spread, which spread the load on ice and work like snowshoes. All of these things make them super predators for their environment. And in their environment, they are the masters. However, if you take a polar bear out of their natural environment, they're not going to do so well. All of those things that were working for them are now working against them. Their large um, blubber that helped keep them warm now is keeping them too warm. The thick fur, all of it's now working against them. And much like a polar bear when it's out of its natural environment, our brains don't do so well when we're not learning in the manner to which they are accustomed and the manner to which they naturally learn. And so I'm going to teach you guys how the brains learn and how they work, and how we can use this information in our class to maximize both our own students' joy and to minimize our time preparing for classes, which is also good for both ourselves and our students. So what happens in our brain when we do anything? You have neurons and axons, and the neuron sends a signal along a set of axons to another neurons or a set of neurons, which sends signal again, and so on and so forth. And that causes us to do basically everything. So for example, if you were in the middle of teaching a lesson and suddenly your door opens and your principal, your superintendent, maybe Dr. Bill Van Pat and Dr. Crash and walk into your room, what happens in your head as far as the neurons and axons? Well, one neuron, or sets of neurons, I'm just going to say neuron to keep it signal, sends a signal turning your head. And another recognizes the noise. And another recalls who these people are. And another, if you're a teacher, is getting your classroom hoping everyone looks like they're engaged. And all of these things happen very, very quickly, and they all happen at once. Because we have been practicing these things, this um, response to sound and recall of memory and how to respond to certain people since we were very, very little. So we're very, very fast at these things. We're very good at them. However, 
when we learn a challenging new activity, like an instrument or a new sport or juggling or a new language, it causes our brain to create new paths between the neurons or strengthen paths that are already present. And our brains don't really want to do this unless they see a purpose. Um, if we have people watching, if any of you have ever tried to learn to juggle or tried to learn a new sport or tried to learn a language, since many of you are probably language teachers, at first it was probably really hard and you didn't really enjoy it. But then you practiced it a little more and those connections in your brain got stronger and then you enjoyed it a little more. And then you wanted to practice it even more. And then you know, those connections got stronger and then you enjoyed it more. And as you went from struggling to good at your instrument or your language or juggling, it became more and more enjoyable and you practice it more. And this kind of frustration with the right guidance can become the practice of word cycle. And if we can get our kids to find what we want them to learn to be rewarding, then they will go home and do it on their own. And a lot of our work is done for us, which is always good. And they won't look like this. And I promise I did not torture my child for this picture. He was just waiting for cake. No interest equals easy distraction in the brain. If we are not interested, like if you're bored already, you're probably thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or what you want to do um, maybe next weekend or what you're going to do tomorrow at school. But if we use our brain's naturally adapted learning capabilities, we can greatly increase learning potential and enjoyment. And much like the polar bear in its natural environment, our brains are language super machines, or really super machines at learning just about anything. So how do we maximize our brain's potential? All that is needed is compelling, deliberate practice with a passionate teacher. So we need to make it compelling and believe in what we are doing. We need to and we need to challenge our learners appropriately. And I know a lot of this sounds like, well, of course we need to do all of those things. But there are very certain things we can do that fall kind of underneath each of these subtopics. And I'm going to talk about all of those with you. And if we do these things, then oftentimes our classrooms can look like this instead of like this. So how do we make it compelling? Or what are some ways we can make it compelling? Well, the most compelling topic to everyone is our own self and our relationship to others. A Harvard study shows we talk about ourselves 60% of the time in conversations and 80% of the time on social media. It lights up part of brain associated with reward, like good food or chocolate, or for me, coffee. The mentalizing system retains information that stores it better than the prefrontal cortex. I'm going to talk about those things right now for just a minute. So there are two kinds of systems that often run a lot of what's going on in our brain. And they're the prefrontal cortex or the mentalizing system. And they kind of work on a teeter-totter. They don't work at the same time. So the prefrontal cortex is what we use for logic and reasoning problems, like when we're um, doing math problems or when we're deciding how we're going to fit everything into a small space or calculating how much um, how many times we can hit snooze before we really have to get up so that we can get to school on time that's the prefrontal cortex the mentalizing system is the system that we use to um, think about ourselves and our relationships with others and you need to think about their brain kind of like a muscle the parts of it that we use more are stronger. And in fact, the parts that we use the most can process information up to 100 times faster than the parts that we don't use. So scientists thought it would be really valuable to figure out which of the two systems was our stronger system, the prefrontal cortex or the mentalizing system. So what they did was they put people into an fMRI machine, and they were scanning their brain as they gave them math problems. And even when they were giving the math problem something like every 15 seconds apart or so, the um, prefrontal cortex, when it wasn't directly doing, the brain wasn't directly doing a math problem, the prefrontal cortex shut off and the mentalizing system lit back up. So even when there was only a few seconds between when the brain would need to use the prefrontal cortex for a math problem, it would turn it off so it could use the mentalizing system. So the mentalizing system is our brain's default system. And when you think of it kind of from an evolutionary standpoint, knowing where we stood in our community and um, our relationships to others was how we survived. It's how we prospered as a species. 
we're not really meant to be a competitive species. We're meant to be a cooperative species. We can, we do best when we survive, um, when we work together. And that's like a whole another topic we don't have time for today. But what they found was that the mentalizing system was the brain's default system. It was the one that was doing the most, pu most push-ups. It was the strongest system. And so they wanted to take it a step further. And they gave two groups of people a description of an imaginary person. And they were trying to test, is the mentalizing system, as they would sus suspect, truly stronger than the prefrontal cortex? And so what they did was they gave two groups of people the same description of an imaginary person. And group A was told they were going to take a test on this information. And so when they read the information about this imaginary person while sitting in the fMRI machine, they used their prefrontal cortex because they were trying to study it logically. But group B was told that they were going to tell a friend about this imaginary person. And so group B used their mentalizing system when they were reading about this imaginary person in the fMRI machine. Now both groups were given the exact same test about the imaginary person. And every single time, the group that had used the mentalizing system um, retained the information better. They scored higher on this test. Even though they weren't prepared for it, they were using their mentalizing system to soak in this information and to relate it to past memories and to their relationships to these other people. And so they retained the information better, better than the group that knew there was a test coming and actually studied for it. And one implication for this in our classrooms is that we want our students truly to be reading for pleasure. If they know that there's a test coming and what they're going to read, they're going to be using their weaker system for reading and retaining um, that sort of information. They're going to use their prefrontal cortex when they're reading. Whereas if they just are reading this so they can talk to us about the book or talk to friends about the book, they're going to use their mentalizing system and they're going to retain the information a lot better. The mentalizing system is really our brain's powerhouse. And excuse me, by the way, if my voice is a little scratchy, I have a, a first couple weeks of school cold today. So we need to make it compelling. We need to make it deliberate when we teach. Storytelling is a really powerful way of sharing information. It's a primal form of communication for our species, and it activates the mentalizing system. A good story causes the brain to experience what is being told in a state of flow. And if you've ever been up in the middle of the night and you've been in the middle of a really good book and you're just turning the pages and all of a sudden you look up and it's four in the morning and you're like, oh my gosh, where did all the time go? That's because you were in a state of flow where you were, you were almost living the experiences of the other characters. Um, memories are strengthened by stories. And we can use stories to help our students acquire information. We're taking advantage of the strongest parts of our brain, and we are also um, utilizing some other really, really strong parts of our brain. And that is one of the things um, that when we have strong emotions tied to stories, we retain them a lot better. When we have strong emotions tied to memories, because it lights up the amygdala in our brain at the same time as we're storing the information, and we tend to store these inf this information better. Um, also, if we um, are telling a story or we're caught in a story, we oftentimes will recall memories from our own past that we tie into our story that helps us retain the information. So for example, if you could close your eyes and picture yourself in the back of a sunny yard and there's a soft breeze and it's a warm day, but not too warm. And um, you can hear wind blowing through the trees, maybe some birds, and there's this house and the house has the open window and coming from the window is the most delicious dessert smell that you have ever experienced just wafting on the wind. And if you open your eyes and you think about what you, the picture you just had in your head, everyone probably pictured a different house and everyone probably had a different dessert in their mind. Some people probably had chocolate chip cookies. Some people might have had snickerdoodles. Some people might have had apple pie or a cake. It doesn't really matter what picture you had in your head. You were taking this and you were tying it to past experiences in your life. And when we teach our students information through stories, we help them tie that information to past experiences. They did this study where they gave two sets of people a list of words to memorize. And they were um, 12 words, 24 people. Half of them studied the lists. 
and the other half made up a story of their own devising to memorize the words. The group that studied them in lists remember, remembered 13% of the words in the lists, but the group that studied them in a story remembered 93% of the words. So rather than giving our students lists, if we can incorporate um, storytelling into our classroom with really basic language, we are taking advantage of so many of our brain's powerhouses, and we can do so so many exciting things and our students won't even realize they're learning because they're just enjoying and absorbing the information. So I'm going to give you just a quick chance to experience that now. I'm going to go back really quickly. Um, I'm going to have you read two slides and one of these slides I've designed to kind of hit, um, I chose rather, to hit your prefrontal cortex and the other I chose to hit your mentalizing system. So as you read these two slides, I want you to think about which one um, is probably activating your prefrontal cortex and which is activating your mentalizing system and which one was more interesting for you. And it's okay if you can't finish them, just, just get the gist. So here's slide number one. And both of these are about the same subject. They're about Teotihuacan, which are these um, ruins in Mexico. So here's slide one. In designing Teotihuacan, the city's architects had arranged the major monuments on a north-south axis with the so-called Avenue of the Dead linking the largest structure, the Temple of the Sun, with the Ciudadela, the southeasterly courtyard that housed the Temple of the Plumed Serpent. The tunnel ran approximately 330 feet from the Ciudadela to the center of the Temple of the Plumed Serpent. The hole that had appeared during the 2003 storms was not the actual entrance. That lay a few yards back and it had apparently been intentionally sealed with large boulders nearly 2,000 years ago. So there's the first reading, and there is the, the ruins in question. And here's the second reading. In the canvas tent erected over the entrance to the tunnel, Gomez's team had installed a ladder that led down into the earth, a wobbly thing fastened to the top platform with frayed twine. I descended carefully, foot over foot, the brim of my hat slipping over my eyes. In the tunnel, it was damp and cold, like a grave. To get anywhere, you had to walk on your haunches, turning to the side when the passage narrowed. As protection against cadence, Gomez's workmen had installed several dozen feet of scaffolding. The earth here is unstable, and earthquakes are common. So far, there had been two partial collapses. No one had been hurt. And both of these clips were from a Smithsonian Magazine article. And if I was in an actual session, I would ask you guys, um, which one, A or B, do you think hit your prefrontal cortex, your logic and reasoning? And hopefully, most of you would guess that it was A that hit your prefrontal cortex or your logic and reasoning. And B, um, where you, the guy was like climbing down the ladder and he could feel the cold around him and you could kind of feel the earth pressing down you. Well, that is your prefrontal cortex. And hopefully you're able to see that, um, I'm sorry, that was your mentalizing system, the second one, where you could kind of picture yourself and feel yourself being there. And hopefully you could kind of see how um, the second one was more interesting, will probably inspire you to want to keep reading about them. I've actually been here and, and climbed this room, and I was so lucky to be able to do it. But even with this being a high interest activity, the one that hit my prefrontal cortex was kind of hard for me to pay attention to. Whereas this one where I felt like I was right there, it was really easy for me to retain the information. So perfect pitch. And I'm gonna talk about perfect pitch just because I want you to explain that Almost all students can learn a language, but it's going to take different amounts of time for different, different students. So perfect pitch is the ability to hear any note and know exactly what pitch it is that you're hearing instantly. And one in 10,000 people develop it normally. Mozart, Beethoven, Horowitz, and Sinatra had it, whereas Brahms, Stravinsky, and Miles Davis did not. We thought for about 200 years that it was an innate talent. You were just born with it or you weren't born with it. You were lucky and gifted or you weren't. There was, there was no rhyme or reason. However, when scientists recently took a closer look, they found out that all who had perfect pitch had also received musical training in childhood. It was more common among those that spoke tonal languages like Mandarin or Vietnamese. And so they did a study where they took 24 kids, ages two to six, 
and they gave them four to five short training sessions a day to identify 14 chords. It took between one to one and a half years, but every single one of those kids developed perfect pitch. And I think this is important, important because what we need to know is that we're never going to be in a classroom where every single one of our students is ready to acquire language at the exact same time. If you've ever had a chance to watch a child developing their first language, they don't speak till they're around a, a year old. But that mark, it's not like every single child speaks at a year. Every single child speaks when they are developmentally ready to do so, when they had enough input and communicative language um, given to them. But we also have to think about the fact that um, our students are all coming from really, really different places. Some students are going to come from a home where they um, have a regular bedtime every night, they have food, they have family that's supportive to them, maybe someone in their home even speaks another language, so they're already getting lots of extra input and they're more ready to learn, whereas other students are going to come from homes where they didn't get dinner, maybe they didn't get breakfast, maybe they fought with a caregiver, maybe they're not even sure where they're sleeping. And so those students' brains are going to be taken up with a need to survive. And those students are not going to be as ready to acquire language. And so when we think about how our brains function and our students, we kind of need to make sure that we are always teaching to the students that are right in front of us. So it's really important that we are, are providing our students who are ready to acquire lots of language with, with a rich environment in which to do so, but also understanding that other students are just going to take more time. I have one of those students who, who just had a rough home time, and he wasn't at school a lot. And when he was there, he was very quiet. And rather than do what I would have done before I learned about all the brain research and about comprehensive input and call home and ask his parents to spend more time um, studying Spanish with him when I knew that wasn't going to help him, I integrated things he liked into every lesson, like sharks. He was into sharks, so every lesson had a shark in it because I knew that was high interest for him. And um, I threw him lots of easy questions to build his confidence. And um, I, I never pushed him. To, to speak when he wasn't ready. And it took about a year and a half, but all of a sudden he raised his hand and he started speaking in, in complete sentences in my class. And I wanted to do cartwheels and jump up and down, but I didn't want to scare him, so I didn't. I just gave him a high five and the lesson continued on. But it was a really powerful moment for me, and it was some anecdotal evidence of the fact that our students can get there. We just need them to be patient and to understand that everyone's brains are going to be in different places. and and. Um, to work to, to honor the students that we have right in front of us. So deliberate practice is the art of practicing until mastery and beyond. I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Deliberate practice, here is kind of our definition. You must be motivated or compelled to attend the task and exert effort to improve your performance. So our students have to want it. We have to, to help them understand why language is important to them and to help them make it interesting for them. That the design of the task should take into account our pre-existing knowledge, our students' pre-existing knowledge, so that the task can be correctly understood after a brief period of instruction. Our students should receive immediate informative feedback and knowledge of results of our performance from a teacher or trainer. And for language students, that's not correcting their accents. Um, when you're thinking about a, a little kid for starting to speak, if they were saying wa wa for water, we're not going to sit there being like water, 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 drilling them, because then they're just going to climb up and not want to speak at all. We're just going to provide them lots of examples of how to say it correctly, and eventually they will get it. The only time I correct students in the classroom is when they're saying the wrong word. I correct for meaning, but not for um, accent. And they pick up accents pretty quickly on their own when they feel relaxed and in a good place. And then we should repeatedly perform the same or similar tasks, making them slightly harder each time. So we need to give them enough, enough repetitions of the language. We can't jump from um, vocab list to vocab list to vocab list because they'll never get it. We need to give them enough repetitions of language to actually acquire it, just like when we learn our first language. So deliberate practice. I want to kind of give you guys a chance to watch. This is one of my favorite videos. It's a chess prodigy, and he's going to explain how his mind works, and it really backs up a lot of what I have been saying. Here we go. I've been assured this will work for you guys. 
The Correspondent Candid with 60 Minutes, Bob Simon. Magnus Carlsen is the top chess player in the world. He's 21 years old. Superhuman is about as good a word as I can find. I can imagine what it's like to be a, a, a good tennis player. I can imagine what it's like to be a good skier. Um, what he does is just unfathomable. Most of the time, I know what to do. I don't have to figure it out. <laughs> I don't have to sit there and calculate for 45 minutes, an hour, to, to know what the right move I just Usually I can just feel it immediately. If you know immediately, why do you sit there for a half hour? We've been watching you for a week and you're sitting there until we're watching the paint dry. Well, because I have to, you know, verify my opinion, see that I haven't missed anything. But a lot of the time it's fairly useless because I know what I'm going to do and then I sit there for for a long time and I, I do what I... Uh, I immediately wanted to do it. He's called the Mozart of chess, and I can see it. You couldn't understand how Mozart did what he did. It came from another world. And Magnus Carlsen is doing things that no human being I've met before can do. <laughs> at one point, he played 10 chess players at the same time, looking the other way, so he couldn't see the boards. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. 10 chess boards that he has in his mind every second. Doesn't lose track of what's happening on the boards and what he needs to do next. Can you explain what was going on in your head? Really, I was just focusing, focusing on trying to remember the positions. And from time to time, I had to think a little bit to come up with a good move as well. Even he admits that it's, it's not easy. I would um, wonder where a certain piece is. And so I had to, you know, replay the game in my, in my head from, from the very beginning. How long did it take you to do that? I don't know. Half a minute or something. Borfira <laughs> Hotra. It will be interesting to try like 20 people sometime. Have you ever done that? No, 10 is the most I have done. And you, but you'd like to try more? It would, it would be fun. I really liked him. Um, there is not a false bone in his mind or in his body. Totally honest. Um, he wouldn't know how to deceive, which is interesting because chess is all about deception. But when he's away from the chessboard, um, you know that when you ask him a question, he's going to answer honestly. So what are you doing for the rest of the day? I'm preparing for the next game. Well, he had a day off. He'd been in London before, but he told us he'd never seen the sights. We took him up onto this, this. It's a giant Ferris wheel that overlooks London, and it's right on the south side of the Thames. So you can see the Houses of Parliament, Big Ben. We were up in the London Eye for... I guess 45 minutes or so. He didn't look out the window. Just, he wasn't interested. Do you ever stop thinking about chess? Sometimes, but uh, right now I was actually thinking about chess. <clears throat> and you were thinking about specific moves? Or? Yeah, I was thinking about something specific in my preparation for my game tomorrow. Magnus told us that he can remember 10,000 games that have been played in the past. He's got them in his mind. Okay. So we set up a board. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> this is um, Carlson Kasparov from uh, <coughs> 2004. And you were... Um, I, was, I was 13 <coughs> years old. It's hard to surprise this guy. Uh, I was trying to surprise him from the day we met. Why were you trying to surprise him? Just for the hell of it. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you guys can see why that was one of my favorite clips of all time. Um, everything I've been talking about, he is so obsessed with chess that you can remember all of these games he's been doing because him sitting there um, remembering these games over and over and over and over and over again in his head is the same as, as real practice. And you can see he was so obsessed with, with um, 
trust that even when he was sitting in the eye of London and had all the sights behind him, he didn't even bother to look at it. All he wants is to think about chess. And because of that, his brain is super fast at processing it and he is brilliantly really amazing at it. But you know, that's about all he does and it's about all he wants to do. That's why I know lots about the brain. I'm not quite that obsessed, but I'm pretty obsessed with it because I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm not saying that we want our students to be quite that obsessed with our, our subjects, but if we can inspire them, if we can get them learning on their own and independently interested, they go home and they do so much of the work for us. And lifelong learners, no matter what I've taught, it, you know, kindling the flame and the love of learning has kind of been like the core of, of my teaching. So another really cool brain trick has to do with mirror neurons and the mentalizing system, which we've already talked about, but mainly mirror neurons. We talked about neurons. Um, mirror neurons are this really cool system our brain has developed and scientists aren't sure the purpose. But what it is, is I told you that when you do anything, neurons in your head light up. But what I haven't shared with you yet is that when you watch someone doing something that you've already done, like um, taking a drink, picking up a cup and taking a drink of water, for example, the same neurons that would light up in your brain if you were actually taking a drink of water, light up if you watch someone taking a drink of water. That's why people say yawns are contagious. If you watch someone yawning, those same neurons will light up in your head and you'll feel the urge to yawn. Scientists aren't sure if this is because we um, use it to learn things or to understand the motivations of others. But what it does mean is that the energy that we bring into the classroom and the level of interest that we express in our students and in, in our subjects is mirrored back at our students. So I'm going to um, give you a chance to experience this and then talk about a few more applications. So when I show you a picture of this woman's face, I want you to think about the emotion that she's feeling, but I also want you to notice what you feel in your own face when you see her face. Here we go. Probably you realize that she is feeling disgust and probably um, many of the people watching felt their own noses crinkle up. That's because of those own neurons in your head that would light up if you were feeling disgust fire when you saw her face. Another, um, <laughs> another way you can kind of experience mirror neurons is um, when you see someone get injured. And I am going to show you just two parkour fails, nothing too gory. Um, but that's why when you are like watching a sport and you see an athlete get injured, you, you kind of cringe in your own body because the same neurons that were firing in their head, um, similar ones, not quite the pain ones, but will fire in yours. It's the same reason why when you're watching a scary movie and you know someone's sneaking up behind the person, you can feel the hairs in the back of your own neck stand up. So if you have really strong mirror neurons, you might not want to watch, but I promise that neither of these parkour fails are too gory. Um, what I want you to notice, though, is where you feel it in your own body when you see these things. Oh, if the video works. There we go. Just the exact same one, one more time, but notice um, where you feel it. When you feel it. If you cringed, congratulations, you have very strong mirror neurons. But what this means for our in class, our implication for our students is that if we are up all night because we need to prep the perfect project or, um, you know, finish that one last email, or if we are bored with what we're teaching and we show our students that, then they're just going to reflect that boredom right back to us. Same, same for if we are frustrated with our students or if you have that student that's just been giving you a really hard time. Take a moment to calm yourself down before you go and talk to your student because if you show frustration to that student, they're just going to mirror that frustration back at you and, and doors are going to close. You're not going to be able to make the connections you need to make a difference for that student. And if you don't take care of yourself and make sure that you're rested up and excited about what you're doing that day, 
it's going to be really hard for your students to be excited either. Be good to yourself. So we must also talk about the brain when it is stressed. I also do um, a whole presentation about teacher wellness, and stress is such a huge um, thing. I know we, we tend to think we can just push stress to the side, but it has so many implications for how it impacts our health and our ability to learn. Um, the, the main thing for ability to learn is to do with the amygdala, which is in charge of our freeze, I should say freeze, fight or flight reaction. When it's activated, new sensory information cannot pass through it to access the memory and association circuits. Social pain and physical pain activate the same centers in the brain. We don't feel like we belong or are afraid of being wrong. We can't learn as well. So this is really, really interesting. The part of your brain that tells you how much something hurts you is the same whether it's the pain of being rejected socially, having someone tell you, no, I don't want you, you don't belong, or um, having like a car run over your foot. The part of your brain that says how much this hurts you. The only difference to our brain between social pain and physical pain is that in the car running over your foot scenario, there's a second part of your brain that will light up to tell you what part of your body is in physical pain, but that is not even the part that tells you how much pain. So social pain is real, and it really impacts our students' learning and our general overall health. It's really, really important that our students feel like they belong. They even did a double blind study with ibuprofen and they found that people who were taking ibuprofen and there, were placebo, there was a placebo group as well that were taking a pill that had nothing in it, um, were hurt less by social rejection in, in this study, which I won't explain because it will just take too long. They reacted less to social pain when they've been taking ibuprofen. Not that I'm saying we should all go home and take ibuprofen, but I'm saying that um, setting up a classroom that's respectful and caring where all students feel welcome is key to learning. It's not just a small part of what we do. It is everything that our students feel respected and safe. This has been kind of called this, this inability to learn when we don't feel safe has been called the effective filter by Dr. Stephen Crash and others. And it is defined of a period of an emotional state of stress in students during which they are not responsive to learning and storing new information. And there's Dr. Stephen Krashen, and there's me, and I totally waited in a really long selfie line just so I could take that picture, and I was very excited to do so. I'm a big fan of Dr. Krashen's work. On the other, the flip side of this, the brain when it's happy. Positive motivation impacts brain metabolism, conduction of nerve impulses throughout the memory areas, and the release of neurotransmitters that increase executive function and attention. And that was a quote from Judy Willis. In other words, the highest level executive thinking, making connections and aha moments of insight and creative motivation are more likely to occur in an atmosphere of exuberant discovery where students of all ages retain the kindergarten enthusiasm of embracing each day with the joy of learning, which just means our kids are gonna do our best, their best, the kids are gonna learn the most, the kids are gonna be the best behaved when they feel safe and happy, when they're not afraid of being rejected. And we can all do that for them. And we're gonna be happiest too. So I'm not going to play this video for you. I look very serious in it. Um, but one of the things you can do to kind of get, <clears throat> get your students back into a calm state is just to do some deep breathing with them. And actually, maybe I will play this, this video for you, with you because it's a great way for you to both explain to your students why deep breathing works to calm them down and um, why well, you can do it in the target language. Plus, it's only two minutes, so it's short. Oh, if it plays one more shot, and then I'll just explain it. There we go. There are two systems in our body, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is activated when we are scared, like when there's a tiger, or when we feel scared, like when there's a test coming up. Our eyes get bigger, our heart beats faster, we breathe faster, and our muscles tense, which helps us react a lot faster, and it's good when we're in danger, but not so good for the health of our body. The parasympathetic nervous system puts the brake on it. Our muscles relax, we breathe more slowly, and our heart beats at a normal pace. Now, these two systems kind of work like a teeter-totter. 
They cannot be activated at the same time. So when we are feeling stressed out, the sympathetic nervous system is on. It's up. Our heart's beating faster. Our pupils are dilated. Our muscles are tense. And some parts of our body don't even work at all. It's not very good for us to be in all the time. The parasympathetic nervous system can calm us down, but we have to learn how to turn it on. Sympathetic nervous system is not good for our bodies. It keeps us in a kind of crazy state, but luckily, we can turn on the parasympathetic nervous system very easily with some deep breathing. We're going to try it right now. You're going to breathe in through your nose for four, hold your breath for six, and breathe out through the mouth for eight, in Spanish, of course. Listos? Por la nariz, hasta cuatro. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Espera. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Por la boca. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho. So, in case that was a little too quick for you when I was talking in that video, your brain and your body communicate. When you're stressed, your heart beats faster, you breathe faster, and then your body says to your brain, ah, I'm stressed out, and then your brain says, get more stress, and that's this kind of brutal cycle. But if your body is saying, oh, we're cool down here, then your brain will calm down too. So if your students come in and they're stressed out because of whatever happened in their last class, or they're riled up because you've been playing some crazy game, taking a minute to breathe um, can really calm the whole atmosphere in the room down and get everyone in a, in a good way to learn too. And the breathing really should be in through your nose for four, hold your breath for seven, and then out through for your through your mouth for eight. And you can do that all in the target language. And there's a bunch of other breaths that you can do. And I know that Megan Hayes and Justin Slocum Bailey both have some different things out in line that you can find that have to do with breathing in your classroom. And I do breathing with my students, and I do yoga, and I do movement. And all of these things are in the target language, so they're still learning in Spanish. But... We're getting their bodies in the right states for learning at the same time. Oh, and I have some um, in the Idea Elefante teacher's manual that I help with through, for um, uh, Carol Gobb. There is um, a whole yoga routine that I did for eating. So when others are watching, this is one more trick. We are more likely to put forth our best effort when others are watching or when we think they are. So they... Participants were in the study, and they thought the study was going to be in the next room, but the study was actually going on in the waiting room. And they um, had someone walk through, and they would drop a pile of books. And they found that people were 30% more likely to help if there was a camera in the room watching the person drop the books. When they, they found that when they put posters of eyes, so people knew these were posters. When they put posters of eyes in the cafeteria, they have the litter. So even that feeling of having someone um, watching you makes you behave a little better. And I did hear, I think I first heard this, um, this trick in a senior only workshop that when he had subs, he would put a picture of himself or a video of himself watching his students while the sub was there. And I'm sure that it both creeped out his students and also made them behave better. And then last but not least, they found that when they put just those three dots that kind of resemble a face um, in a room where they were getting people trying to get people to donate money, people are three times as likely to donate money. So our place in society and what others think of us is really important to us, and we think others are watching. We generally behave better. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. And this was actually a quote that really stuck with me when I was <clears throat> a million years ago, a student teacher in, in the College of Education. Our students really will, will be who we see them as often. So when we, we see the good in them and we see their potential, a lot of the times we can bring that out in them. And I think that's an important thing to share and to remember. Sound in the brain. This is, these are some things I learned from Christy Plastido many years ago at IFLT. Sound tells a story, and the emotion you set with sound supports that story. A Tufts University study shows that the brain, or the auditory cortex, responds differently to different types of sounds. Sounds that carry more intense emotions, which vary based on culture, personal experience, and many other factors, create greater neural response. So, 
um, just to, to kind of give you an example, I, I heard about this study in NPR where they were trying to get people to donate to shark conservation. And they were trying to see how sound would impact their willingness to donate. And so one group was given one soundtrack along with some images of sharks. And one group was given a different soundtrack with some images of sharks. And one group was very willing to donate and the other one was not so willing to donate. So I'm going to let you listen to both of those right now. And um, my, my example is not entirely scientific because the, the images are not the same, but I think you can guess which soundtrack made people more willing to donate. Here's one that is very similar to soundtrack A. This is the biggest predator in the ocean, the great white shark. It can reach six meters in length and weigh in at over 2,000 kilograms. A supreme hunter equipped with rows of serrated teeth and an arsenal of super senses. An encounter with this apex predator in its own element is the stuff of nightmares for most. An experience only f so there's one and here is that was that was say soundtrack a kind of mysterious and here's soundtrack b <coughs> i think you can guess that soundtrack b is the one that um people were not really so willing to donate to the sharks anymore, whereas Soundtrack A, they were willing to give a dollar to save the sharks. So kind of the, um, I had a slide there, but it must have disappeared. Kind of the um, implication for this in the classroom is that if you have a story and your students are pro providing sound effects, what Christy, Christy Placido did in the session that I attended was she read a section from her book, Robo en la Noche, um, and when it was jungle, people would make jungle noises. And when someone was running down the street, people would make like running down the street noises and flashlights would turn on and it would go, people would make sound effects. And it totally changed the atmosphere in the room. And so the other way you can kind of use this in the classroom is like, I play a game with my students called Bad Unicorn, which is a version of Martina Bex's Mafia. And when I put some slightly creepy fantasy music that I'll just pull off of YouTube on in the background, the intensity level of playing this game goes up by like 20 notches. It's incredible how intense that room gets. Or if I I know the students are tired and I'll put on some like Rodrigo and Gabriela and have some upbeat music when I come, come when they um, come into my room playing, that just changes the atmosphere too. Or if students in your story are crossing a river, having the sound of running water, or if there's thunder and lightning in the back of a storm, any of these things are going to add this level of intensity that kind of helps your brain play along and get more into the story and um, kind of ups everything for you. And, and remember, when we attach strong emotions to things, we remember them better. So when you think about the difference between studying these lists which is really not the way our brain remembers them, kind of our old school legacy way. And I used to teach this way versus a story where we're just totally engrossed in what we're doing. There's really only one clear way that we can teach a language that is going to help our students actually be communicative um, language users. Language as mental representation is too abstract and complex to teach and learn explicitly. And that is Dr. Bill Van Patten. And I did wait in another long selfie line to talk to him. So when we think about this, if our goal is communication, according to a study done by Mark Davies at Brigham Young University, learning the first 1,000 most frequently used words in the entire Spanish language um, allows you to understand 76% of all nonfiction writing, 79.6% of all fiction writing, and 90% of all oral speech. When we think about kind of legacy teaching versus comprehensible, comprehensible input, and I did used to be a legacy Spanish teacher, it doesn't really make sense for us to give our students long lists of words and lots and lots of topics that they're not really interested in because it's going to be like pouring water through a calendar. They're going to retain so very little of that. Whereas if we just repeat the most, interest, the most important words 
both to them and to us in really interesting and fun ways. Not only do we get a lot of um, bang for our buck as far as preparation, we get students that are really excited about what they're doing and are actually able to acquire and learn the language. So how do we add it all to our classrooms? There's so many different ways. And that's kind of the beauty for me of teaching with comprehensible input. We can teach about anything we want as long as we can teach about it in a comprehensible way. So we look at students' interests. We can talk about what interests them, whether it be a spider that's crawling on the wall, a crazy t-shirt they're wearing, their dog that ran away, or the Detroit Tigers. We can tell stories that will draw everyone in. We can let them read, free voluntary reading, where they're not tested, remember, because then they use a prefrontal cortex, but where they can just talk about these books with you and with each other. is a really amazing way for them to acquire language. And it doesn't matter what they read. We don't have to get them reading all sorts of different texts, as long as they're reading and enjoying it. Music, games, Netflix. I know for myself personally, when I started teaching with CI, with comprehensible input, my Spanish was not where it needed to be to teach with comprehensible input. And my instant, because I couldn't like weave a story through the class and automatically know how to, to speak all the time. And my instinct, what my training taught me was to go grab my 501 Spanish verbs book and start really nailing myself on grammar rules. But instead, I was like, if I'm going to teach my students using comprehensible input, I need to do the same with myself. So instead, I started watching my Netflix and, and in Spanish with subtitles so I could read and hear at the same time. And I started reading books in Spanish. And so not only could I get to say, like, oh, I've been working all night when I've really been watching El Internado on Netflix, um, but my Spanish jumped light years um, in the most enjoyable way possible. And we can do that for our students too, and it's enjoyable for everyone, you and your students. Stories, give your students stories. You can read books together as a class. You can let them read um, on their own. There's so much good material out there, and it's growing every day. I have read all of these books, and they are all amazing. And you can write stories with your students, too. It doesn't really matter what, as long as you're good stories, they're going to acquire language. Um, we're not going to have time to play this video, but this is me just doing um, student interviews, special person interviews. And Bryce Hedstrom and Grant Boulanger have a lot of really great stuff on this. But use your students as material. Students love their relationships to others, and the students love being the source of information. And you can find lots of stuff on how to do persona especial on the internet, and that's more. But I'm, again, we don't have time to show that one. Navelly in the brain. This is important. If we can make it slightly novel while still um, <clears throat> using the same words that they need to hear over and over, they retain it even better. Subjects performed best in these tests um, when new information was combined with familiar information during learning. After a 20 minute delay, subjects memory for slightly familiar information was boosted by 90%. It had been, been mixed with new facts during learning sessions. So basically we wanna use stories with familiar words but make them slightly different. And there's so many ways that we can do that. Um, one of them is just by typing them up and changing a minor detail of the story. Another one is um, Reader's Theater, which is super awesome. We can rewind, we can fast forward. We need to remember when we're doing Reader's Theater, we are not um, doing it for a perfect performance. We're doing it just to get our students extra repetition of language and a story in a slightly new way. Um, we can do it with puppets, and especially if you have elementary, they love it. They can, they can describe the puppets, they can take them home, you can tell them they only speak to them in Spanish. Even older kids, kids of all ages really like to play, and if you change the content of the stories, all kids really like doing these things, even adults do, even adults like to play. I learned about all the world's a stage from Karen Rowan, and this is super fun. After the students know a story, you break them up into small groups at the classroom so everyone has an acting part. The teacher reads a story, and every single group acts at the same time. This is a great way for you to see who understands and who doesn't understand the story, but it's also a great way for you to see which groups might be super interesting that you might want to pull up for the whole class to watch or even record for another class. Sleepwalker, um, and we don't unfortunately have time to watch this either, is another really great way to um, get your students to um, 
Sleep Walker is another really great way to get your students to show you if they understand. And you only do it after they've already got the story and they really have it down. And all you do is you have everyone close their eyes and you read the story and you have them act out every single part of the story with their eyes closed. And if you have a, a class where you've built up the trust the right way, then you can actually record it. And then you can show it to them afterwards, which gives you another repetition of the story. You can put it up, up online and they'll go home and watch it because they love watching themselves. And you can show it to another class. So you can get a lot of bang for your buck without a lot of prep with this activity. Theater and style, which is something I learned from Craig Shee, which is where you just act out Again, the same story, but you have them act out the story as robots or cowboys or as video game characters like Minecraft characters or lazy style or pirate style or fairy style. You can see all sorts of styles and my students um, added to the styles as we went, but you can record and post. You can have kids guess what kind of style the group's using. These are just, you don't need to use these every time, but having a large variety of tricks to pull out of your bag really helps keep, keep things interesting and novel for your students. This is a really great activity from Carol Gobb called Probable or Possible, and it allows you to get students predicting about um, text, even when they don't have a lot of language. You can read them a story, and then you can make a statement and say the girls were scared, and they can say probable or possible. And the other great part about um, this activity with Carol is that there's no wrong answer. So if one person says that it's probable they were scared and the other person says possible, well, each answer can be right depending upon how you interpret it. Um, I could keep going with lots of alternative activities, but unfortunately, we are really, really close to the end. So I'm just gonna fast forward and show you guys a couple more things really quickly. I have lots and lots of games. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to go into them today because I do have to finish up at five o'clock. Um, but playing games with your students is another marvelous way, both brain breaks and as whole class material. And I have a lot about games on my website, which I will give you. Um, and these games by Martina Bex and myself are some of my students' favorite activities and they're great ways to produce or to provide comprehensible input. Just gonna show you um, three last things really quickly. And, then I will try and log on later to answer questions. When you give students the chance to access information online, they will go there. I made a website for my students and I put up games and cartoons and music. And these are the kind of things that I put on the website for them. And my students were going on there an average of 500 times a week. My website had 41,741 hits um, um, uh, in the first year. And there's just games and cartoons and music and it was all in the target language and it was voluntary. And my students went there because they wanted to and my parents would talk to me about how much fun the Spanish homework was for my students. Well, it's because they were watching themselves in Spanish, they were watching cartoons in Spanish and they were listening to interesting stories. And because of that, they acquired so much. Education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. And if we can get our students interested in what we're doing, most of the work will be done for us. I have just a couple of minutes, and I wanna show you just two examples of where students can go when they're inspired. This was a class pet, and I have permission from these parents to share this. Um, I made a class pet for each grade, and it's a stuffed animal, and the students got to take it home for a week, and they make up a name for it and they tell a story about it. Sorry, not an, a story, but they make up a name and what it likes and answer some of their high frequency questions about it. And then they either send me in a picture, an email and I print it for them, or they draw a picture and then we get to talk about it. Kind of like a special person interview that they make up for the stuffed animal. But this brother and sister decided that instead of a special person interview, um, instead of just a, a worksheet, they were going to uh, make a whole video. And so this was her first year and her brother's second year in my class and she is in first grade. And you can see she understands by um, her actions and her brother is ready to produce, to output where she is only ready to show comprehension through input. Me gusta caminar, me gusta correr, 
Me gusta bailar. Me gusta subir una montaña grande. Me gusta saltar. Me gusta volar. Me gusta cantar. La, 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 la. Me gusta comer galletas. Me gusta dibujar. Me gusta jugar el Minecraft. Me gusta besar. Me gusta dormir. Buenas noches, Lily. So that was the first video these students made me. They made me a video every year, and I'm not going to play you every year, but I just want you to hear the difference between the first year and the last year that they made me this video, and then I will give you guys my contact information and appreciate that you spent your time with me today. Here's the last video. Hola, dinosaurio. ¿Cómo estás? Yo estoy bien. Me gusta volar. Me gusta volar también. Yo veo el perro y el jaguar. Va, vamos a hablar con el perro y el agua. Vale. Hola, nos gusta volar. Es, es muy, muy fantástico. fantástico. Nosotros podemos uh, ver muchas uh, cosas. ¿Qué puedes ver? ¿Qué puedes ver? Yo puedo ver un tren. Y un carro. Y vegetales. Y un elefante. ¡Fantástico! Tú puedes ver muchas cosas. Yo quiero volar. Uh, trata, trata, trata de, uh, de volar. Uh, pienso que uh, nuestros no podemos volar. Yo también, yo estoy uh, triste. Puedes uh, tratar uh, de volar. Uh, tratar uh, de volar. Vale. Voy a tratar de volar primero. Yo pienso que no puedes volar. Pero yo voy a tratar. Fantástico. To be fair, I should tell you that these students, well, I did only see them twice a week for 36 minutes, were um, two of my students that loved Spanish. They went home and did all of the things. But most of the students will show incredible growth. Really, all of my students, if you just connect with them and, and teach them the way their brains are meant to learn. Um, so I'm not going to, oh, that was the, I won't show you guys this one, but that was the following year with their little kindergarten sister. It's, it's pretty cute. So I will just leave with this. Compulsory physical exercise does no harm to the body, but compulsory learning never sticks in the mind. Reach your students the way they're meant to be reached. Do yourself and them a favor. Rest yourself. Connect with their brains and enjoy what you teach and everything will kind of fall into place. So I have lots and lots of resources. Um, I have blogs about a lot of what I've talked about today. I have um, ideas for the classroom and all sorts of other great stuff at my website, which is profaithaplinsky.com. Um, you may email me at profaithaplinsky at gmail.com, though I will warn you, 
um, I'm a full-time mom with three little kids, so I get back to people when I can, but it's not always quick. I try, though. And Twitter at perfectbuplinski.com, and um, that sent questions, co comprehensible online. I forgot to change that slide, slide though. Um, so if you have any questions, you can email me or post them on Facebook and the Facebook Live comments, and I'll do my best to answer them later. Thank you so much for sharing your Sunday with me, and I hope you have a joyful week back in the classroom and a restful rest of the evening. Goodbye.